Hello, my name is Nicholas Morton, and in this talk, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the geography and landscape of the Near East, focusing in particular on the key factors and themes that were important in the medieval period, and within that, the Crusades. So, the first point to make is just how variable the landscape is across the region. In this first photograph, you can see the area around the historic fortress of Masada. And as you can see, it's very dry, it's very arid, and this area of desert really begins once you get much further south than Jerusalem. But there are many other types of landscape in the Near East as well. This next photograph shows an area of the Shuf foothills leading up into the Lebanese mountains. And here you can see there's much more lush, lots more, lots more vegetation, there's much higher precipitation, and it's a very different kind of landscape. And then also, in this photograph, you can see the region around the Crusader Castle of Sayon, which is known today as Saladin's Castle. And here's a different kind of landscape. Again, it's very thick vegetation, it gets more rainfall, it's got shrubs and undergrowth. It's a very different type of landscape to the previous two. So variation, it's a key point to begin with. And as you'd expect in a very varied landscape, there are some areas that are very suitable for agriculture and also for grazing animals and some which are much less suitable. So the main areas of agricultural land across the Near East are firstly and probably most importantly the Nile Delta. And the Nile Delta in Egypt, naturally it gets inundated with the waters of the Nile on an annual basis and that brings with it natural minerals and fertilisers that keep the soil very suitable for agriculture and so it's not surprising that Egypt historically has a reputation for supplying much of the region's cereal crops and in particular grain. But there are other areas of good farmland as well and another area is the coastal region of the Levant from north to south. Now here you've got a very narrow strip following the coast where there is um, historically intensive agriculture from north to south. And the reason that this coastal area is particularly good for agriculture is due to rainfall. Because in this area you have um, often very hot days and when the land warms up that causes the, the air above that land to rise very quickly. Now conversely the sea doesn't warm up so fast so when the air above the land rises up that brings in a sea breeze and that sea breeze brings with it water vapour and therefore rain. Now because that sea breeze is coming onto the land it therefore encounters very quickly the north-south highland or mountains which then forces that air to go up and as it goes up it gets colder and that means that it then rains on the mountains which then comes down as rivers to then irrigate the coastal plain. So that coastal strip is enormously important for agriculture and of course if it's good for agriculture that also means it's very important geopolitically as the various powers of the Near East compete over the available farmland in the region. There are other areas of good farmland. The Silesian Plains in the north would be one. Another is the Hauran region to the south of Damascus. Other areas which don't have quite the same level of precipitation. In some cases they're suitable for the cultivation of vines or olive trees. But then as you get further east you typically get into more and more desert regions which aren't suitable for cultivation. So those are again, those are some of the key factors to consider when thinking about the map of the Near East. In this next photograph you can see this very much in practice. What we're looking at here is we're looking at the Lebanese coast looking south from the town of Jebel and in the medieval period um, this was part of the county of Tripoli and you can see here not only the very fertile agricultural coastal strip but also how quickly the land begins to rise up towards the Lebanese mountains. Now we've already touched to some extent on the whole theme of climate but one of the key features that affects much of the Near Eastern region is that there is a dry period and that dry period typically covers the, the months from roughly sort of April to October 
when there's very little rainfall. Nearly all the rain falls in the, um, in the winter, and so this too is a crucial consideration. And so the next photograph I've got to show you here, this is the, um, these are some cisterns from a rather unusual castle called the Cave of Tyron, which is in the Lebanese mountains. And this is a castle that was made of wood, which is quite unusual for the castles um, in this area. And it sort of clung to the side of a cliff. But what you can see here is sort of within, um, within the cliff ledge on which it perches, there are these large cisterns. And the idea is these cisterns will collect rainwater during the winter months so that, that water is then available in the spring and the summer. And the same is true of many Crusader castles where you have often very large cisterns, some the size of small swimming pools, which are there to provide the castle or a town in some cases with the water it needs when that water is not available during the dry season. The wet season is also important, not just because it provides water for um, the population all year round, but it's also important because this affects the military um, landscape of the area, and it's a crucial consideration for commanders when planning their military campaigns. And so we know of several campaigns which stalled because they encountered heavy rains in the winter, and therefore they had to withdraw. And this seems to have been a factor in the 1129 campaign against Damascus, led by Baldwin II of Jerusalem, but also during one of the advances on Jerusalem organised by Richard I during the Third Crusade. So again, we need to think about climate in terms of the way it affects the region's architecture, but also the way it affects the conduct of war and indeed other areas of economic and cultural activity as well. Another very dramatic aspect of the Near Eastern region is that there is a large geological fault that runs through much of the area. And this is called the Great Rift Valley. And you can see this in the photograph. What you're looking at here is you're looking at the view from a Crusader castle called Belvoir over the Jordan Valley. And the Jordan Valley is just one part of the Great Rift Valley that runs through much of this region, taking in areas like the Bacar Valley, Lake Tiberias, the Jordan Valley, the Dead Sea, and then all the way south until you get it, until it enters East Africa. And so that too is a very important factor. And of course, being on a fault line means that the area is very prone to earthquakes. And so on many occasions, throughout the history of the 11th, 12th, 13th century. There are occasions where there are major earthquakes, which in some cases are so severe in their impact that rulers actually make peace because they have a common desire to rebuild, to ascertain the level of damage that they suffered and to try and support their various communities. So earthquakes can be a major factor in the broader political history of the region. That leap moves naturally on to the question of geology, rock type. Now, there are various um, different areas of uh, rock type in the Near East. There's quite a lot of sandstone, there's a fair amount of basalt, and there's also a lot of limestone. And this is important because limestone in particular is the a crucial building material for many of the castles, the palaces, the city walls, the religious buildings of this region. It's a very um, good stone for building, very durable, not too difficult to shape. And so the basic geology of the region goes some way to explaining the way in which all these buildings and the urban and human landscape of the area was constructed. Now, another really important factor here is the whole question of woodland, because timber is really important not just as a building material, but also to build ships. And of course, some woodland includes fruit orchards, which are important for the food supply. So knowing how the woodland is distributed across the Near East is a crucial consideration. And the key factor is there isn't much of it, not really good quality building timber, and nearly all the really good timber is in the north. So the region of Silesia and southern Anatolia, there is some good building timber on the coast, perhaps most famously the Lebanese cedars. But the point is that good woodland with really good quality building timber is fairly localised. And this is really important because that will then affect the economic map 
Everyone needs timber for shipbuilding or construction, and so areas with good quality timber will be in high demand. So it's important to be aware of where the good timber can be found, and certainly there are plenty of treaties, um, particularly with Egypt and the various powers further north, where the Egyptians specifically want to ensure that the supply of timber is not interrupted because they depend heavily on timber shipments coming down from the north for their various construction projects. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of some of the key factors to bear in mind when thinking about the geography of the region and how that then impacts the broader history and developing events of the medieval period. I hope you found it useful.